Weight loss jabs could be used to get unemployed people who are obese back to work. 3,000 people are going to be taking part in a five-year trial that starts in Greater Manchester. The plans have been announced by the health secretary, Wes Streeting. He's hoping the jabs can help ease the £11 billion burden of obesity on the NHS. So joining us now, Treasury Minister James Murray. Very good morning to morning. you. Is this morning. a good use of the government's money? Look, I think it's really important that we tackle the obesity crisis, um, and this is one tool uh, that we can use uh, to make that happen. Obviously, it has to be alongside all of the other measures around preventing people from getting overweight, uh, teaching children uh, about better eating and so on. So there's a lot of different ways in which you can make people uh, better, uh, healthier, uh, tackle the obesity crisis, um, but I think this is an important part of it. Um, and if it helps people to get back into work, uh, that's really important for individuals and for the economy too. So it's a five-year five year, uh, trial. What if it works? What's the plan, looking ahead? Um, well, we've just announced a trial, so let's see what happens uh, with the trial. But I think the point here um, is that we need to uh, go at the problem of obesity from a number of different angles. And as I said, one angle is clearly stopping people from getting overweight and obese in the first place, uh, but also if people are overweight and obese and need help uh, to get back into work, to be healthier, uh, these jabs are an important part of that. And, you know, we have a, a situation in this country where a lot of people are long-term economically inactive, which means that they're not in the workplace even when uh, they want to be and could be. Uh, we want to help make sure they get back to work because that's good for them and that's good for the economy. But you've got a concern, haven't you? Well, well I, 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 I like some people, and we've had a bit of a response to this um, from our viewers this morning, see it as a slightly dystopian thing, a, a little bit sinister. Um, this is the government in getting involved in people's choices of how much they eat, uh, how much they drink, how much exercise they do. Uh, it just feels slightly sinister to, to, to think of maybe if the, if the trial works and it's, and it's rolled out across the country, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people basically being, being pretty much told to have these injections. Because if they refuse, what will the government do? Will it say, well, OK, you won't have the jab, you don't get your benefits? Well, look, I think that's, that characterization goes a bit over the top. I think this is a conversation that will happen between individuals and their doctors uh, to work out what the best way is of making uh, them healthier, of helping them to be healthier. Um, and I think having these uh, weight loss jabs is, is one tool uh, in that kit. You know, this is something which will empower doctors to have a conversation uh, with their patients and work out what's best for them. So I think, you know, it's an important part of the overall approach. Uh, but as I said, it needs to sit alongside the other aspects about promoting healthier eating, about giving people uh, when they're sorry, giving children uh, more information about how to eat healthier when they're young. Okay. What about the people who have been getting in touch with us this morning who say they're working people, um, they would like to have this jab, weight loss jab, they're on a waiting list or they are buying it privately, but the uh, supply is so short that even those people who should be getting it now can't, and now they hear there's this big multi-million project that the government's running for unemployed people. There, there's a sense of injustice there. Well, what you point to there is, is about there not being um, enough um, of the jab mm. or at the right prices. Um, and we had a big international investment summit yesterday where we um, announced uh, £60 billion worth of investment, 40,000 jobs. Uh, and one of the investments which was announced was a, about investing in life sciences, about investing in the production capacity for this jab uh, here in the UK. So that's a really good news story, obviously, because it's investment in Britain and it creates jobs and so on. Uh, but it also means that we can then create, uh, we can produce that jab here. Uh, I mean, British people can get more access to it. So, you know, I think the, uh, the, the outcome of the investment summit yesterday is obviously primarily about growth and about getting the economy growing. But we can see other benefits um, from what that growth produces. So we're going to produce this particular drug to Zepatide here, are we? Is that how we're going to increase supply? Uh, also, there's an investment, that company uh, who produces that jab has announced their investment, their investment in Britain, uh, because life sciences is actually a sector which is, you know, really successful in Britain and that we've uh, been very proud to have the uh, but investment But it's going to increase supply here? That, that, that's the idea, yes. Okay. So that's the, that's the investment. And it's, it's alongside, you know, there's plenty of other investments in the summit yesterday. Right. There was about £60 billion in total. Uh, data centres, uh, new energy sources, expansion of capacity at Stansted, right across the piece okay. uh, okay. is about uh, investment. Time is, time is short. Uh, let's change the subject quickly. Um, before the election, you guys 
promise that national insurance, amongst other taxes, would not go up. Now it's pretty clear that employers' national insurance contributions are going to go up. Uh, and, and Labour have said, well, that's, that isn't a tax on working people. But it is, isn't it? Because if you ask employers to pay more national insurance, they're not going to be as happy to give their workers pay rises. They're not going to be as happy to contribute to their pensions. They'll probably freeze those. So actually, it may not be a direct tax on working people, but it's a pretty indirect one, isn't it? Well, the conversation here is about what our pledges were in the manifesto, what our promises are going into the budget at the end of this month. Um, and in the manifesto, we said that we won't increase taxes on working people, national insurance, income tax, um, VAT. Um, but in the budget at the end of the month, uh, the Chancellor will set out all of their decisions around taxation, spending and welfare. There will be some difficult decisions. Um, but the reason for taking those difficult decisions is to bring back economic stability yes, but, so that sorry, we can I'm sorry, get the economy would you, growing. Would you, not accept, would you not accept the, the fundamental economic logic that if you get employers to pay more national insurance, their workers are going to suffer because that extra payment will be passed on to them through, as I say, frozen pensions or no pay rises? Well, look, I'm not going to speculate about the impacts um, of what might be in the budget. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is the commitment that we made about not increasing taxes on working people. And I think, you know, can I just say that it's really important to remember the context in which we made that pledge about not increasing taxes on working people, which was uh, the last government where we saw living standards fall and working people's standard of living being squeezed. So we felt it was a really important commitment to have in our manifesto about not increasing taxes on working people. And we're sticking by that as we go into the budget. Yeah, the working people who are the employers might think of it as a breach of a manifesto commitment. That's going to be your issue, if, in fact, that is what happens in the budget. I want to ask you about something else, because last week the Culture Secretary was on this programme. Lisa Nandy was asked about pension credit, and in her answer it sounded like the deadline to apply was going to be extended. I just want you to have a listen to what she said. It's one of the reasons why we've extended the, the cut-off point to apply until April next year, so that even if people don't realise right now, despite this sort of conversation happening on national media, even if they don't see this, if they don't realise, if they don't respond to the letters, if we don't manage to catch them door-to-door -door in the run-up to Christmas and they find out later that they're eligible, they can still apply and they will get it backdated. We believe that Lisa Nandy might have been talking about the deadline to apply for the Household Support Fund, which is being extended until the end of March. So we just wanted you to clarify, as someone at the Treasury, when is the p application for pension credit deadline? Um, look, I don't want to give your viewers any inaccurate information. I haven't got that, that, that exact date in, in, in front of me, so I don't want to give information on your TV that's, that's incorrect. Okay. Um, what, we, what we need to do is make sure that people who are eligible for pension credit uh, sign up to it, and that's what we've been focused on over well, the summer, December and I would the, urge does, everyone to do that. Does December the 21st ring a bell? Because that's what our inquiries have told us is the deadline. As I say, I don't want, because I haven't got the date right in front of me, I don't want to give your viewers inaccurate information, but I do want to make sure that everyone who's eligible for pension credit uh, signs up for it so they get that help they need. Okay. okay. Minister, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning.